Thank you. So some of your customers are going to have feedback. Right? They just are. And that's what happened in this situation. This is an actual review on TripAdvisor.com for a Chicago area location of White Castle. You guys know White Castle? Uh, old school hamburger chain, mostly in the Midwest. Here's the review. While driving to the airport near the end of our Midwestern journey, I heard what appeared to be hyperventilating coming from the back seat of our rental car. My 16-year-old could not believe he was actually seeing a real live bona fide white castle and he begged us to go in. Now, since we were pretty early for our flight, we decided to go ahead and let him have his Harold and Kumar go to White Castle moment, a movie which he asserts is the greatest stoner film ever. <laughs> stoner film. Like there's a category for it at Sundance. Stoner film. Like there's a category for it at Sundance. Now, that seems like a pretty positive review. However, there's a second half. I cannot believe that these people actually exchange real American currency for this square steamed mixture of rodent feces and sawdust on a tiny bun. <laughs> this is the bastard love child of 7-Eleven microwavable meat patty and the entrail drippings of roadkill left to fester on Midwestern highways in the hot July sun. Happily, it's as thin as a post-it note so as not to avoid inadvertently engaging your gag reflex. So that review took a decided turn, I think, uh, we'll agree. As a consultant, just a little quick tip here. Anytime you see the word roadkill in a review, it's almost always bad. <laughs> almost always. Uh, the most amazing thing about that review, though, and, and this is amazing still, is that that is a two-star review. <laughs> two stars. Uh, two stars. I really, really want to know what her one-star review reads like, right? <laughs> what is the one-star review? So, like our, our natural human reaction for all of us, of course, what would be to just ignore that, right? To walk away, to dis dismiss that as the rantings and the ravings of a crazy person. <laughs> but that is actually the worst possible thing you can do. Earlier this year, I conducted a massive research project with the guys at Edison Research, and we surveyed thousands and thousands and thousands of Americans about who complains, where they complain, why they complain, and how. And what we discovered was remarkable. We found that not answering a complaint decreases customer advocacy, always. It takes a bad situation and makes it worse. Conversely, answering a customer complaint takes customer advocacy and increases it. It takes a bad situation and makes it better, always. So, so what this means is that instead of ignoring the people who complain, we need to embrace them. The people who complain about your business, the haters, they're not your problem. Ignoring them is. What we need to do instead is to embrace complaints and use them to make our businesses better. We need to embrace all complaints. Now, is this uh, time consuming? Yes. Is it difficult? Yes but it is absolutely worth it. Now, and I'm not saying that the customer is, is always right, far from it, but I am saying that the customer is always heard. What I'd like you to think about is how you can answer every complaint in every channel, every time. Every complaint, every channel, every time instead of what we typically do, not just in this industry, but in all industries, which is to answer some complaints every once in a while when we feel like it. Right? I mean, that's what literally happens. It's, that's the truth. This makes a lot of business sense for, for two big reasons. First, hugging your haters helps you keep the customers that you have worked so hard to attain. It helps you keep your customers. And I think we all know, we've all heard, we're, we're all familiar with the concept that it is much more financially wise to hold on to the customers you already have than it is to continue to have to get new customers all the time, right? Everybody is familiar with that concept. Yet, we don't run businesses that way. Nowhere. Not here, not anywhere. We don't run businesses that way. Globally, we spend $500 billion a year on marketing and $9 billion a year 
on customer service. So we know that keeping customers is financially prudent, yet we do not invest accordingly. And this is despite the fact that plenty of research shows that even a 5% increase in customer retention can produce a 25 to 85% increase in overall profits. It just makes financial sense to hug our haters. One of the companies that is very much moving into this hug your haters landscape is Discover Card. About 18 months ago, Discover said, we want to be the best financial services company in the world when it comes to customer service and customer experience. We are going to commit the resources, the time, the energy to be great at this all the time across all channels. We're going to answer every complaint, every channel, every time. This guy, Rob Especial, was on vacation. He came back, checked his email, and he had multiple offers for Discover Card in his email. And he's like, what the hell? So he went to Twitter, and this is what he said. I haven't checked my email in a few days, and there are three offers for the Discover Card. Persistence or lack of coordination? Persistence or lack of coordination. But Discover is all about answering every complaint. So they answered back in just a few minutes. At Rob Especial, we must be excited to have you apply. DM with your full name and full address if you would like the mailings to stop. Amy. Yeah, answered him right away, gave him a resolution, made it human by using her name, and it actually worked. He tweeted back. At Discover, kudos for the prompt response time. Okay, I'll bite. Mostly because of your response, Amy. Hashtag great service. Hashtag great service. Here's somebody who expressly went to Twitter to complain and ended up taking out a credit card application <laughs> just because they got back to him fast and were actually good at it because they hugged their haters. Now, historically, what we would call this, of course, is customer service, right? But is it really? Is it customer service or, what, or is this actually one-to-one -one marketing? Is it one-to-one -one marketing that builds relationships one person at a time? Because I believe, and I think you will believe, that customer service is the new marketing. This is how businesses are going to differentiate now and in the future, by being great at customer service and being great at customer experiences. Now, the second reason why we all need to hug our haters, is that it actually makes you a better company, a better property manager, if you take the time to listen and to pay attention. See, haters and customer feedback in general is really the canary in the coal mine. It is the early warning detection system for your business because nobody is going to go online and say something about you that is 100% invented, right? This isn't fiction. You may disagree with elements of their story, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's typically not fiction. 95% of dissatisfied customers in all industries never take the time to complain. They just fade away, they just disappear, like poof, gone. At least haters are using their time to help you improve your business. Haters are essentially the unelected representatives of what I call the meh in the middle, right? The customers are just like, eh, I didn't really like it, so I left, who just are silent. Haters are the mouthpiece for that much, much, much larger organization. Incredibly important to be paying attention to the feedback that customers are providing because if you do that, you can make yourself a better organization. As Brian mentioned, there's tons of reviews and feedback about Appfolio across many, many, many different websites out there on the internet. Here's an example from somebody who says, room for improvement, but a pretty good program, what they like, what they don't like about Appfolio. If you pull out what they like least, it says here, a few accounting features are cumbersome and hard to use properly. Well, if I'm Appfolio, and this is what they, now that I'm an owner, this is what we're gonna do. No, this is what they already do. They already do this. <laughs> they pay attention to these kind of reviews and say, okay, engineering team, which keeps growing like an amoeba, why don't we work on some accounting features, right? If you're paying attention, your customers will tell you 
what to work on. Now, you can do this very, very simply. This does not require a ton of horsepower, necessarily. Uh, just to put this slide together, this took me like 10 minutes. I went to Amazon.com, uh, and, I, and I copied and pasted the last 10 reviews on Amazon for my book, Utility. I just copied and pasted. And I went to a, a free site called Wordle. It's wordle.net. And I just pasted all that copy in there, pressed a button, and it made this word cloud. Literally five, 10 minutes, boom, here you go. So what this shows me is, hmm, a lot of people are interested in examples. One of the reasons people like utility, there's lots of examples. So when I write new books, when I give different speeches, I'm always changing the examples, right? You can use this kind of technology to pick up on trends across multiple reviews that people are leaving about your business. Very, very simple. But you can take this feedback from haters and turn it into sort of a river of insights that really helps you conquer the competition. One of the companies that's amazing at this, it's crazy, is uh, La Pan Quotidienne. And they're a, a chain of about 200 uh, cafes. They're based in Belgium, many locations in the US, primarily uh, in the East. And, and their customer experience manager, Aaron Pepper, is really, really great at this. So when they do get a negative review on Yelp or uh, TripAdvisor, those are the two sites that they would typically see, uh, she, she does a, a very smart thing. She answers back in public all the time and says, we're terribly sorry we disappointed you. Thank you for your feedback. I'm going to direct this to the store manager to make sure that these deficiencies can be corrected. Uh, we hope you give us another chance. You know, that, that general kind of response, which is definitely the way to go. But what she does next is what is so incredible, an idea that I want you to steal. So she answers them in public, and then... A couple hours later, she answers again in private. Most of these review sites have a private messaging function. She messages them, messages, messages them back in private and says, you know, sir, I've been thinking, and you are a discerning customer. You see things that other people simply do not see. You have a gift. What I'd like you to do, what I'd like you to do, with your permission, of course, I would like to send you two gift cards per month. And I'd like you to use these gift cards to visit a different La Pan Quotidian location. And when you do, I'd like you to click this link and fill out this detailed survey of your experiences because you have a rare ability to understand our business in a way that most of our customers simply do not understand. And it totally works. She has more than 100 of these secret shoppers <laughs> visiting cafes every week all around the country. All it costs her is gift cards. She has successfully turned hate into help, which is quite remarkable. Haters are not your problem. Ignoring them is. Let's talk a little bit more about haters. I want to introduce to you the Hatrix, which is the analysis of, of who complains and why. Now, in my research, I, I found that there's actually two types of haters, two main types of haters. The first type are called offstage haters, offstage haters. And, and we call them offstage haters because they complain in private legacy channels like phone and email. Offstage haters are slightly older. They're slightly less technology savvy. Uh, they are less likely to be active in social media. And over the course of a year, they will complain less frequently. The second type of hater are the onstage haters. And the onstage haters are called onstage haters because they complain in public. They complain on Twitter, Facebook, Yelp, TripAdvisor, discussion boards, forums, all the places where there are other folks watching. These onstage haters are slightly younger. They're certainly more mobile and technology, social media savvy, and they tend to complain more frequently on average. But the biggest difference, the biggest difference between the offstage haters and the onstage haters is what they expect. 
It's what they expect of you, what they expect of me, what they expect of all business people. The offstage haters, what they really want is an answer. They want an answer to whatever it is that's bothering them. And in fact, my research found that nine out of 10 offstage haters expect a reply. And, and I'm sure that's true in your own world. If you call a business, if you email a business of any kind, you generally expect them to get back to you at a very high rate. You expect a reply. Like this guy who left a voicemail on the Jimmy Dean sausage hotline. Randy Taylor. I don't know where you people come from. I don't know if you test your products, your quantity of your product. Your products are very delicious. Love your sausage for 30-something years, but I can't take and feed a family of five on a little 12-ounce roll of sausage. I don't mind paying you more money for your 16-ounce roll of sausage, but you don't have it anymore. You've got a 12-ounce roll, and you've got three men that weigh over 200 pounds apiece, a woman that's a little plump Scotch girl, and a daughter who's 13, and you're going to try to take a 12-ounce roll of sausage and a couple of dozen eggs and feed that, it ain't going to work. And I'm not going to purchase your product anymore or ever again. And as far as your 16-ounce of maple and sage, I don't eat that. I'm not from the north. I'm a Texas man. Jimmy Dean sausage is for southern people to eat with their breakfast with their fried eggs and their T-bone steaks. And I can't see going to a little 12-ounce package to feed four, five, six people. And I'm not going to buy two of those 12-ounce packages just because you want to downsize and charge the same goddamn price. <laughs> I'd sure like a reply, and I'd sure like you to go back to your 16-ounce package on your regular sausage, because I'm not going to buy it otherwise ever again. I'll just have my own damn sausage made like I used to 30-something years ago. It's not as tasty as yours is, but it'll work. Goodbye. Let's hear it for Randy Taylor. A man, a man, a man with a serious sausage problem. This guy has got some issues. He expects a reply, as most offstage haters do when they telephone. Now, you've got to continue to hug these offstage haters, A, because they expect a reply, B, because there are so many of them. Right now, as we sit here, approximately two-thirds of all complaints are offstage, are phone or email, okay? About two-thirds today. But this ratio between offstage and onstage is changing very, very quickly because of technology. It's changing very quickly. In fact, in the United Kingdom, social media complaints about businesses increased 800% from January of 2014 until May of this year. 800%. That's staggering. And that will continue to happen everywhere in the world because it's so much faster and easier to complain on a mobile phone with a mobile app than it is to call, email, write a letter, walk into the front door, et cetera. And think about when today's young consumers, and many of you uh, deal with young consumers all the time and millennials, think about when they become the dominant consumer group, which is not that far away. Are they gonna call and email? I have two children shown here. My daughter's 17, my son is 14. My son's birthday recently, those are his birthday shoes. And of course they have smartphones, but, but literally is there a product ever in the history of products that is more inappropriately named than the smartphone? Because the one piece of that device that they almost refuse to use is the phone. <laughs> no interest. And, and if you make them use the phone, it is a horrible set of circumstances. Like, so if you give my son the phone and say, hey, talk to your grandmother. First you get an eye roll, and then, and then he's, this is what he does. He goes, uh, Hello? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> okay. And hands the phone back, right? It's like a conversational train wreck in slow motion, right? It is brutal. It's painful. 
But yet, they'll send 300 text messages a day, right? And they use Snapchat the way I eat bacon, like greedily and lustily. <laughs> I, I just don't, I don't, I cannot see a scenario, maybe I'm wrong, but I cannot see a scenario where five or eight years from now, when they're, you know, in their mid-20s, or whatever, they're like, well, you know what? I've been overlooking the joys of the phone. I gotta get on that, that technology is amazing. Like, I just, I don't, I don't think that's gonna happen. I really don't. And they hate email, too. The only time they check email is to look at receipts for stuff they bought online. That's it, that's it. So, yes, we've gotta to continue to pay attention to the offstage haters today, but let's start realizing that not too far down the road, the onstage haters are going to be the overwhelming majority of the customer interactions in all businesses. And these onstage haters have a very different psychology compared to Randy Taylor, the sausage man, and the offstage haters. Because the onstage haters, what they really want is an audience. They want an audience, which is why so many reviews and tweets and Facebook posts and things like that are so colorful and interesting, like the White Castle example, because they are seeking an audience. They want their friends to say, great review, Bob. They're competing for attention in social media the same way we compete for attention in social media. And in fact, fewer than half, fewer than half of all of the onstage haters even expect a reply. They're just complaining on Facebook, Twitter, Yelp, TripAdvisor, apartmentratings.com, whatever. They're just complaining. They don't even expect to hear back from you half the time, which is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for all businesses. Because when you do, when you do answer back, you can blow their minds and win their hearts. They don't expect it. So when they hear back, they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you're listening. It absolutely works. Here's somebody who had a negative uh, Yelp review, a very negative Yelp review about a property. Uh, Jay Tremontazzi from Lion Properties, who is an Appfolio uh, customer, actually answered back. He hugged his haters and he said, hey, here's what happened. And she revised the review. Actually went in and revised the review. It absolutely works. Now, we, we did a little survey uh, inside the conference app and found that 84% of you are not using any technology and not really monitoring uh, this kind of review scenario on a regular basis. We've got to get a handle on this. Now, I, I'm gonna tell you a story about a company that has taken this hugging your haters approach uh, to its logical conclusion. And that's KLM Airlines. KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. They're based in Amsterdam. And today, they answer 60,000 60, social media complaints and questions a week. They have 100 people who do nothing but answer questions in social media. They do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they staff it in 14 different languages. So if you tweet them at three in the morning in Turkish, they will answer you back in a few minutes in Turkish. And they started this program not because they had some sort of internal cultural epiphany, like we should hug our haters, it's good for business. They actually started this because of a volcano. Some of you may remember a few years ago the huge volcanic eruption in Iceland. And it was this enormous ash cloud, and the ash was so pervasive it grounded all the flights in Europe. Nobody could fly through this ash cloud. And so KLM is a very important airline for continental Europe. They're smack dab in the middle, lots of flights go through their hub. And so they had literally tens of thousands of flyers stranded. And of course, people are freaking out, like, what am I gonna do? I'm stuck in Poland or whatever. And so uh, they said, well, we got two options here. We can either pretend this isn't happening, we can ignore this, or we can find a way to answer everybody. But if we answer everybody, we can never go back. We can never go back to the old way because you can't very well tell your customers, great customer service during times of volcano. <laughs> like you can't, you can't do that, right? I mean, volcano special, right? Like you, know, you, either, you either do this or you don't do this, right? So they had a bunch of people in their team who couldn't do their job anyway. Pilots couldn't fly, flight attendants couldn't fly, baggage handlers had no baggage to handle. 
So they said, all right, they just got a bunch of card tables and laptops and said, start answering. And they answered everybody. And that was the beginning of their program they now have today, which is world class. They answer everybody. In fact, they're so committed to this that if you look at their Twitter account or their Facebook account, the actual graphic on the back there shows how long you should expect to wait if you tweet them or put a Facebook post on their Facebook page. And they change that graphic every five minutes. Some of you may have seen billboards in your city that says that about the emergency room at the local hospital. You know, expected wait time, 25 minutes. This is the expected tweet time. <laughs> Remarkable. And while this is customer service, quote unquote, it's also marketing. Last year, this team, who was just answering customer complaints and questions on Twitter and Facebook, sold $30 million worth of airline tickets as an aside, accidentally, as their second priority. Haters are not your problem. Ignoring them is. Everyone in this room is very familiar with the ratings and reviews industry. Yelp, For Rent, ApartmentRatings.com, et cetera. And it matters in every industry, but it particularly matters in your business. Here's a apartmentratings.com uh, page for the Summit Point Apartments, which is near my house in Bloomington, uh, Indiana. 24 reviews, all kinds of detail. It is an incredible treasure trove of information for the uh, potential apartment seeker. I understand that ratings can be difficult. Uh, I understand that this is how many people, <laughs> how many people feel about ratings. I love this. This is classic. I want to make t-shirts with this and just hand them out at events. It's so great. This guy, this guy gets it. Right? It's a love-hate relationship that we have with reviews. We want feedback, but we only want positive feedback, which is sort of a, a difficult scenario. And a lot of times, we sort of get into this habit of saying, you know, if it wasn't for Facebook and Yelp and ApartmentRatings.com and Ferrant and all these guys, I wouldn't have to deal with all this negativity. And actually, that's not true. Because people have been talking shit about you forever. They just haven't been doing it. They just haven't been doing it in public, right? I mean, it's not, you know? And I think we're blaming the messenger here. When I was a kid, one of my high school jobs was I was a stock boy at TGNY. TGNY was a long since defunct chain of small department stores in small cities in the West. I grew up in Lake Havasu, Arizona, which is not too far from here. Woo! I know there's a couple of Havasu folks here. So, uh, I worked at TG&Y, and I was a stock boy. One of my jobs was to take returns uh, from customers. And so a guy came in one day, and he, he wanted to return some underwear. And that underwear was not new in package. It was, <laughs> he'd, had, he'd had some time with this underwear. Um, <laughs> and, and I thought that that was a curious decision. I'm like, is that, is that a thing? Can you do that? And so I was not equipped fully. I was neither equipped nor trained to, uh, to handle that situation myself as a 16-year-old. And so I went to see my manager. And my manager, and <laughs> I swear this is true, my manager's name, perfect manager title, perfect manager name, his name was Mr. Big. So uh, <laughs> I went to go see Mr. Big. I said, Mr. Big, uh, this guy wants to return some underwear, and he's worn this underwear. And he said, well, why is he returning it? And I said, uh, he says it's not the right size. And Mr. Big said, well, is that before or after he wore it? And I said, well, that's a good point. Uh, and I said, well, we're not going to do that, right? And Mr. Big said, no, we are. We're going to take it back. Our policy is no questions asked on returns. And I didn't really understand that at the time, and I don't totally understand it now. But I'm sure many of you are familiar with that kind of policy. But here's the one thing that Mr. Big didn't do. Mr. Big didn't say, you know what? If it wasn't for all these cars bringing people back to the store, we wouldn't have this underwear return problem. But when we blame Yelp, when we blame TripAdvisor, when we blame Facebook, when we blame Twitter, when we blame ApartmentRatings.com for people leaving reviews about our business, we are blaming the messenger. We are blaming the conveyance in the same way that Mr. Big could have blamed a car for bringing the underwear to our door. Here's the reality. Some of your customers suck. <laughs> Thank you. Right, there's more. Um, some of your customers suck. Some of your customers sucked 50 years ago. Some of your customers will suck 50 years from now. Technology does not impact people's morality. Technology does not make people worse people. 
right? It just gives you the opportunity to see negative feedback in a way that we couldn't see it before. That's the difference. Now we have a magnifying glass that we didn't used to have. And I gotta tell you, these reviews are important. They're incredibly important. 80% of Americans trust online reviews as much as they trust personal recommendations, even though in almost every case, those reviews are written by somebody who is a total stranger. And it's this weird thing about the internet, because if this happened in the real world, the dynamics would be entirely different. So let's say you're, you're going to uh, the grocery store, I guess it'd be Ralph's around here, or Kroger, where I'm in the Midwest now, uh, and, and you're going to walk into the store, and there's a guy kind of off to the side by the front door, and he's wearing like a hat and a trench coat, and he's like, uh, psst, psst, hey, hey, buddy, hey, buddy, and you're like, me? He's like, yeah, come here, come over here. And I'm like, what? He's like, uh, hey, listen, listen, um, when you get in there, try the creamed corn. <laughs> what? It's like, try the creamed corn, it's amazing. I mean, if that happened in the real world, you would call the cops, <laughs> right? You would call the cops. But online, they're like, thanks, great review, thumbs up, right? I mean, it's like, <laughs> A totally different dynamic. It's a totally different dynamic. And you're not gonna be able to fight against that. You're not gonna be able to, to change that psychology. You gotta embrace complaints and use them to turn bad news into good. And not only do complaints matter, do complaints dictate how people buy, how they consider, how they shop, when they move in, but it also has a huge impact on how people even find you. Here's a, a search I did on Google for the uh, Howard Management Group, uh, which is an Appfolio customer in Los Angeles. So let me just show you, this is the Google search engine results page. Okay, that is Google reviews. That's a pretty large chunk of the page, I think you'll agree. Uh, that's from Google. Here's this is uh, reviews from Yelp. Here's this, which is reviews from Yahoo Local. Here's this, which is reviews from yellowpages.com the majority, perhaps the overwhelming majority of the real estate on the Google search result page for your name is all the reviews that people have left about you all over the internet. That's how important it is. If these reviews are bad, and people are like, these guys suck, you're not even gonna get the click, much less a move in. And it matters just as much, if not more so, when you search for more general topics. I did a search for property management in Goodyear, Goodyear, Arizona, and what comes up? This enormous ad, essentially, for Sunseeker. I think Sunseeker's here, aren't they? Maybe. Sunseeker, woo, over there in the corner, Sunseeker. Well done. Uh, there's Ken right there. Ken Ellis on Sunseeker, 47 reviews and a five-star average. You the man, you the man. <laughs> That's your wife's picture? Well done, well done. I'm going to give you some birthday cake, brother. <laughs> so, I mean, look at this. I mean, if you, if you do this search, property management, what are you going to click on? This boring stuff over here? Or this, like, pictures and reviews and 47 five-star reviews? I mean, your hand's like tractor beam over here, right? It matters. This kind of stuff matters. I mean, even ForRent.com is sucking in reviews from all over the Internet to your property profiles on their platform. My good friend Erica Campbell Byram is gonna talk all about that this afternoon in her session about reputation management. She and I wrote Utility for Real Estate uh, together last year and she is incredibly smart. Do not miss that session. She's gonna tell you all about how ForRent.com manages reputation online. So how do we handle these, these opportunities to respond? Here's what I think is the best playbook. Um, my friends at Fresh Brothers Pizza, which are, they have about 14 locations based in Southern California. Some of you may even know Fresh Brothers. Uh, it's a more of a West Coast offense around here. Um, so Debbie, who's their owner, handles it this way. If somebody leaves a positive review, four star, five star, she answers back on Yelp and says, thanks so much, we're delighted that you had a great experience. Uh, can we send you a gift card so that you can come back and try us again, maybe bring friends? Smart. If somebody leaves a negative review, she says, we're really sorry we disappointed you. We had an off night. May I send you a gift card and you can give us another try? And you're probably sitting there thinking, well, how many gift cards is she giving away? People are gonna sucker her out of gift cards. That's crazy. That's exactly what I thought. And when I interviewed her, I said, hey, Debbie, like, this seems dicey. How many gift cards are you giving away? 
aren't people taking advantage of this and like scamming you for free gift cards? She said, well, two things, Jay. First, we keep a list of who we've sent gift cards to. So it's not like we're just like, you know, dropping them out of an airplane. And two, who cares? Who cares? What's the cost of a gift card to us in comparison to what this can do for our business? It's the cheapest marketing we could ever do. Who cares? Interesting perspective, very smart. Now, what some, sometimes people do, I'm not saying anybody here, but maybe, what sometimes people do in order to kind of play this reviews game is they wanna make sure that nobody leaves a bad review. Number one, that's flawed thinking because all the research shows that a few bad reviews actually improve the believability of all your reviews. That if they're too positive, then people are like, wait a second, maybe only their cousin Leo wrote those, <laughs> right? And that's just human nature, right? If they're too positive. So I'm gonna leave Ken Ellis a one-star review uh, about his property uh, on the way out, so we'll, we'll even that out. No, I, won't, I wouldn't do that. But so what happens is sometimes businesses in, 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 a, in a desire to kind of play this game will try to artificially suppress negative reviews. And one of my favorite examples of this gone horribly wrong is the Union Street Guest House in uh, upstate New York. So the Union Street Guest House had this policy where if you were staying there as a guest or having a wedding there or a bar mitzvah or anything else, if you or anybody associated with your group left a negative review about them on Yelp, TripAdvisor, et cetera, they would charge your credit card $500. <laughs> a $500 penalty for a negative review. And this was on their website and they actually tried to charge people. The New York Post got wind of this <laughs> and wrote a big newspaper article about it and online. Uh, and predictably, it did not go well for Union Street Guest House. Uh, they got approximately 3,000 one-star reviews in an hour. Uh, and uh, it kind of turned the tables on them. Yelp and TripAdvisor took most of those out because they knew they were fraudulent. Uh, but the policy was removed and the owner apologized and things like that. But this is not the right way. Uh, to approach this. I hope we can agree on that. I want to give you uh, a couple of tips uh, about hugging your haters, a couple of tips on how to do this particularly well, okay? The first tip is that we have to recognize haters and then empathize with haters. We have to look harder to find them. As Brian said, there's lots of places where people talk about Appfolio, including some that maybe you don't even know about. The same is true for you. There's lots of places that people are talking about your business and or your properties that maybe you're not monitoring on a regular basis. You have to look harder. You have to look harder. And then when you find people who are unhappy, hopefully you will choose to answer back. You will choose to hug your haters. But when you do that, you have to have empathy. Because especially for the onstage haters, in many cases, they're twice angry. They're twice angry because whatever happened to make them upset the first time, and then they probably called you or emailed you but weren't happy with how that went, so then they took it public. This happens all the time, that people start as offstage haters and then become onstage haters because they weren't happy with how it was handled originally. This happened to my friend Chris Rund. Chris um, is a cat owner. This is not his cat, this is a stock cat. Uh, but his cat um, uh, was, was uh, vomiting, as cats do, and he was tired of his uh, cat vomit staining his light carpets, and so he sent an email to Meow Mix, which makes the cat food that he feeds his cat, and they didn't get back to him. They didn't get back to him. So he was like, what's the deal? So he raised the stakes. He took it public. He started as an offstage hater and then became an onstage hater, and he left this post on the Meow Mix Facebook page. Dear Meow Mix, cats throw up pretty regularly. Figured you guys would realize this, being cat experts and all. With this in mind, why do you insist on putting dyes in your products that cause ruined carpets, furniture, etc.? You know, when Kitty spews her half-digested meow yuck all over the place. Seriously, my cat doesn't give a shit what your product looks like in a bowl, and neither do I. What would be helpful and appreciated by legions of cat owners, I'm guessing, 
is if you take the worthless dyes out of your product and save us all a lot of frustration and ruin fabrics. So Chris is upset, and I think the need for empathy here is clear. But it was not clear to Meow Mix because this was their reply on their Facebook page. Hi, Chris. All Meow Mix products are made with nutritious quality ingredients that meet the standards and specifications of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, Association of American Feed Control Officials, AAFCO, and the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. If you have further questions, our Consumer Affairs team will be able to help you. You can reach them at 1-877-MEOW-MIX, 877-636-9649, or by visiting meowmix.com and clicking the Contact Us link at the bottom of the page. That is not empathy. That is copy and paste, is what that is. We've got to be better than that. I want you to be better than that. Meow Mix should be better than that. If you're going to take the time to answer, if you're going to take the time to hug your haters, at least take the time to understand that they're angry and make them feel a little bit better. My second tip is to obey Jay Bear's rule of reply only twice. Reply only twice. It doesn't matter whether you're answering a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment. Never ever reply to any customer more than twice in public. Because if they're happy, you're just wasting time. You've already thanked them and maybe thanked them a second time. There's no need to keep going down that path. If they're unhappy, you're going to get sucked down into a vortex of negativity that is counterproductive. So let's say you've got an unhappy customer. Let's say, uh, let's say his name is Chad, which uh, has no relationship to the guy who bullied me in high school. Let's just say his name is Chad. Um, and let's say that uh, Chad is unhappy and he goes on uh, a site and maybe goes on your Facebook page and says, oh, I hate that this complex is terrible and the clubhouse was dirty and whatever. You hug your haters. You reply back and you say, Chad, we're really sorry to disappoint you. Uh, we should, um, you know, appreciate the feedback, we're going to work on it, we'd love to talk to you about it uh, to get some additional details, etc. In some cases, haters like that will answer back and say, you know what, you don't even know what you're talking about, this place is so far gone, it's so terrible, it doesn't even matter, like, you're the worst, you know, they just completely don't want your help. At which point, you reply again and say, really sorry you feel that way, Chad, we really would like to talk to you about this, here's our phone number, here's our email address, etc. And then, if he comes back a third time, you just walk away. You just walk away. Because you've done what you set out to do, which is taken a shot at turning that person's negativity into at least neutral. And more importantly, you've shown every other person that ever sees that exchange in the history of the world what kind of person you are and what kind of company you are. Because my friends, customer service is a spectator sport. Yes, you want to make Chad happy, but Chad is probably the second most important person in that interaction. The most important person is all the other people who are going to see this into the future. Do not reply more than twice. No good will come of it. My third tip is that you've got to be fast. You have to be fast everywhere. If you're going to answer people, you have to answer them quickly. In social media, my research found that 40% of the people who complain on social media expect a response within an hour. 40% expect a response within an hour. The average amount of time it takes a business to reply in social media, five hours. So we've got a gap there that we have to try and close down. But it's not just in social media. We have to be fast everywhere else. Today, on average, businesses take 44 hours to respond to an email. And remarkably, that's eight hours slower than it was a year ago. Somehow we've gotten slower at email. And so what happens is a situation like Chris's, where he emails Meow Mix, and maybe they email him back in two days, but he thought that they weren't going to email him, and so he went to Facebook and made this whole public hullabaloo where if they just would have emailed him more quickly, the whole thing could have been handled in private. 
okay? Two days is a long time to wait for an email in the modern world. And we have to be fast on the phone as well. The research shows that speed of resolution is actually the most important factor in people's satisfaction with a telephone call. More so than accuracy, more so than outcome, more so than anything, speed of resolution is the most important factor. Why? I'll tell you why. Nobody likes smooth jazz enough to wait on hold. <laughs> Customer service centers are keeping Kenny G's career alive. <laughs> Just, I mean, the guys, the royalties are incredible. Incredible. One of the other ways that you can actually be faster is to use your community, to use your residents, to use your customers to help answer as many questions as possible. Let them do the work for you. Appfolio is doing a great job with this in the Appfolio forums. Here's an example uh, where, where Todd Breen had a question uh, about some, some manual processes and report running. So instead of Appfolians have to answer this, uh, Colin Flanders jumped in and said, oh, hey, here's exactly how to do this. So another customer went in, answered the question, solved it before the company even had to get involved in it at all, which increases speed, increases satisfaction. Think about, is there a way that you can get, especially in a multifamily situation, you can get residents helping other residents and take some of that question answering, complaint resolution duties away from you and put it on them. Haters are not your problem. Ignoring them is. But one of the most frustrating parts about customer feedback, really about life, is that haters can only see what they see, right? They only know what they know. They only know what they can see. And in many cases, there are some kind of relevant extenuating circumstances which caused a deficiency in your operations. Uh, my friend Debbie, who runs the Fresh Brothers pizza chain, uh, says that her number one store out of 14 stores, her number one store in terms of volume has the worst Yelp reviews. Why? Because they're always so busy. They're always so busy. Pizza comes out late, toppings aren't perfect, right? They're almost victimized by their own success. In your world, you know, maybe you had uh, somebody at a property who had weird circumstances or maybe some construction that you were doing didn't go well or you were doing some maintenance and it took longer than you thought. There's all kinds, of, like I own properties, as some of you may remember from last year, I am a property manager in a very, very small scale. But sometimes there are reasons why people are upset. And you're like, man, I just... But they don't know what those reasons are. They can only see what is in front of them. They don't care, nor do they know what the big picture is. And this happened to me uh, in a very meaningful way uh, several years ago. In, in 2001, I was living in Phoenix, and my best friend since second grade married my wife's sister. So my best friend became my brother-in-law, which I totally recommend if you can engineer that. It's awesome. <laughs> it's an amazing, it's a great gig. Work on that. So uh, the, this is before we had kids. So the four of us spent like all of our time together. We're really, really good friends. And unfortunately, I was, we were both 32 uh, at that point, and my best friend Al, who was my brother-in-law, uh, was diagnosed with brain cancer. And he had a bunch of very serious surgeries, and as part of one of those surgeries, he lost the power uh, of speech, so he could no longer speak. So in 2001, I was living in Phoenix, and I had season tickets for the Arizona Diamondbacks. That was the year that the Arizona Diamondbacks were on an incredible playoff run, went to the World Series against the hated, dreaded New York Yankees. So I got tickets to game seven, uh, and I had one extra ticket. There's only one person I ever thought about taking who was Al, because in addition to being my best friend and brother-in-law, he was super, uber, crazy, enormous Yankees fan. He grew up in Yonkers, New York, and was a Yankees fan since he was a little kid, so of course I was gonna take him to the game. Well, my other friend Pete, uh, who actually had the tickets in his name, had, for reasons I still do not understand, somehow lost the playoff tickets uh, a few weeks prior. Just, I don't know, the dog ate it. I've, how do you lose playoff tickets? But, so the, the, 
the consequence of that was that for each playoff game, we had to go to the box office before the game, show our ID, and say, we don't have the tickets, and they would just print us out new tickets, right? But they would use like just the printer in the back, like, eh, eh, like dot matrix, right? It didn't have the, the hologram, didn't have the hologram souvenir World Series tickets, right? They're all suitable for frame, just a regular ticket like you'd get at a small time concert. No big deal. Well, we get to game seven, uh, and some of you may remember that this is right after 9-11 right after 9-11. So security for this game was unbelievable. They had CIA, FBI, you know, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, all kinds of off-duty folks, undercover. Here's how serious it was. They went around and they welded shut all the manhole covers in a mile radius of the stadium, right? In case, you know, who knows? It was just incredible. So we go to the game and we sit in our seats and we're watching the game and Al pantomimes to me that he's going for a cigarette. I'm like, I know, not totally socially acceptable now, but look, if you have brain cancer, like a cigarette's like whatever, smoke all you want. So, <laughs> smoke two at a time, right? So, he, uh, he, goes down, he goes down to the left field corner where the smoking section is. So he goes down there and, uh, and I'm watching the game, and I'm watching the game, and I'm watching the game, like what is, what is he doing? Like where is he? So I'm like, I gotta go on a hunt. So I go out to the left field corner. I walk out to the patio, and there he is up against a brick wall, and there's a security guard yelling at him, and he's in handcuffs. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> what has gone astray here? So I rush over, and I'm like, what's going on? And I'm getting into it, and the, and the security guy's like, are you with him? I'm like, yeah, and he's like, oh, boom. So he handcuffs me too. <laughs> so now, now we're both standing there in handcuffs against this brick wall during the World Series, and it turns out because we had the other tickets, right, the, the you know, kind of fake looking tickets, they thought the tickets were in fact fake and that we were somehow a terrorist cell that were infiltrating game seven to do harm to the country. Now this was not a regular uh, Diamondback security guy. Again, they brought in all this extra security. So he's just, you know, doing what he's been told, which is, these are what tickets look like. This is not what a ticket looks like, right? And of course, everybody's super jumpy. So I'm pleading my case uh, as, as politely and then less politely as possible. And, and we sat there, and we sat there. We sat there for five innings of the World Series until eventually we were able to corral a member of the Diamondback staff who said, oh yeah, those tickets are fine. So they unhandcuff us <laughs> and send us on our way, no apology or anything, of course, uh, send us on our way, and we got back to our seats just in time uh, for the ninth inning, where the Diamondbacks rallied uh, and uh, won the game on a base hit off of Mariano Rivera, who's the greatest closer of all time. Here's how it sounded. Florida, center field, the Diamondbacks are world champions. About three weeks later, Al died, and it was an amazing um, set of circumstances. It was really hard for me then, still hard today, but it taught me a really important lesson about taking advantage of opportunities and spending time with your friends, but also this point, that haters only know what they can see. For many years, I, I was upset and bitter and angry about that security guard, and then I realized, like, he was just doing what he was taught to do. Right? He, it wasn't, you know, he, there was extenuating circumstances that he did not know. And the same thing is often true when people complain about your business. You may have a valid excuse, but they don't know that. Right? You can't be angry about them. You can't be bitter about them just because they don't know your excuse. Today, 80% of companies say that they deliver exceptional customer service. 8% of their customers agree. <laughs> we got a problem. <laughs> we have a small problem. Uh, I want all of you to be the very, very best that you can be in this area. Because customer service is the new marketing. Look, your competitors can steal everything from you. They can steal your pricing. They can steal your marketing. Uh, they can steal how you do business. They can steal your customers, they can steal everything, but the one thing they cannot steal, the one thing they can never take from you, 
is if you genuinely care more about your customers than they do.